gentlemen, in the podcast you're about to listen to, we talk about the idea of finding and deserving the ultimate girlfriend. I'll tell you what, as fortune would have it, that's exactly what this month's masterclass for men is on. If you happen to be listening to this particular episode right as it's released, sometime between the Friday it's released and the following Wednesday, you can sign up to attend that class live by heading to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash masterclass and getting your ticket. It'll be right there at the top of the page for you. Looking forward to seeing you there. And now here comes a very interesting, entertaining and spirited discussion with my friend Valid Al-Jabari on the topic of women all over the world. Stay tuned. Live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters, you're listening to the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. Oh, how's it going, gentlemen? Welcome to yet another episode of the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. As always, I am your host, Scott McKay, at Scott McKay on Twitter. And pretty much every other social media outlet out there, with the exception of Instagram, where I'm at Real Scott McKay. And I want to also invite you to join our Facebook group, which is the Mountaintop Summit. Gentlemen, we got a happy group of guys out there who are getting better with women and enjoying every minute of it and the company of other gentlemen as they do. We want to have you join us as well. Please go on Facebook and find us at the Mountaintop Summit. And as always, the website is mountaintoppodcast.com. Now, listen, guys, I have covered the topic that we're going to discuss on today's show before, but I believe it was in the context of one of my older programs that uh, perhaps ironically was named after the old Chick Whisperer version of this product, the program called Chick Whispering, which you can still buy to this day in the X and Y communication store. But after all these years and all my world travels and indeed significant interest in this subject on my part, this is the first time we've ever done a podcast where we focus on that topic. The topic du jour, of course, is women all over the world. We're going to talk about similarities and differences And, you know, if you listen to this podcast, been doing so for a while, and or receive my daily newsletters, you've heard me allude to this uh, plenty of times. It's uh, indeed something I like to talk about, but usually in passing, like I said. What I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to my guest, and I'm going to ask him for his thoughts on this first, so we can have this show go in all kinds of new and exciting directions. Now, who is this guest? His name is Valid El-Jabari, and I had the recent pleasure of being on his fantastic podcast, which you guys should also listen to, which is called Divorce Stories. He is from New York City. Valid, man, welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. I had so much fun on on my podcast, and hopefully I can return the favor and and, and make it a a fun show for your listeners. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, I have zero doubt that you will, man. We had a blast (laughs) indeed on your show. I mean, it became a Rogan-esque marathon of like three and a half hours, and it felt like 15 minutes. Yeah, I did warn you. I told you this is going to last a lot longer than an hour, and uh, it ended up lasting you know, a lot longer than an hour, and it was fun. (laughs) And I was like, yeah, no problem, man. I know how to be crisp. I can it was not fun. talk for three hours. Yeah, well, so much for that. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we are not going to do that to you guys on this show. <laughs> We're not going to do that for you guys on this show either, depending on how you want to look at it. It's a glass half full, glass half empty thing. Uh, this glass will remain half empty, though, because we never go over an hour on this show. Usually we aim for about 35, 38 minutes. Walid, man, you're originally from Morocco, and we're just concluding a World Cup that was particularly exciting for your home nation now, wasn't it? That was insane, yeah. So we're, just for your listeners, we're recording, you know, for the listeners that don't care too much about soccer, we're we're, uh, recording this episode about a week after uh, the final of the World Cup, and it's just been an amazing month, I think, for a lot of people who are just fascinated by the World Cup, by the cultures that are involved in the World Cup. Eva even saw the the the, the coverage from Fox. Uh, it was very much, you know, 
about discovering the the culture in the Middle East, the cultures of the teams playing, and it was just you know it was it was a lot of fun. And um, the reason I ended up in this country, so um, yes, I am originally from Morocco, born and raised in Morocco. Um, so I did spend about 18, 19 years of my life in Morocco and, and the, re- the, the other half, uh, so I'm 40 years old I pr- and I spent about 20, 21 years here in the U.S., um, you know, discovering the American culture, um, comparing it to the Moroccan culture, to the European culture, uh, but also, you know, having first, uh, like very good exposure to other cultures, to other women, to dating other women. When I was in college, uh, I went to college in Philadelphia, where the school that I went to, which was Drexel University, had a had a, a big uh, international population. So other than Americans, there were people from all over the world, and you know, dating girls from different uh, areas of the world was was very enlightening. And you know, and I think it's something that I use on a daily basis in my life. You know what always makes me chuckle a little bit is when people call any majority Muslim country Middle Eastern. I mean, I think they put Indonesia in the Middle East if they actually knew (laughs) Indonesia was majority Muslim. But I I need both hands to count how many times I've heard Morocco (laughs) referred to as a Middle Eastern country. Yeah, and and, and so again, I think we I'm going to keep referring to the World Cup because I feel like because for the first time, an African slash Arab country um, has made it as far as Morocco did. So they went to the semifinal of the World Cup. They're top four in the world now. And a lot of people started, um, you know, at the beginning of the World Cup, people were referring to Morocco as an Arab Middle Eastern country. And then as Morocco kept, you know, beating all these countries, they beat Spain, they beat Belgium, they beat Portugal, like all these countries that were supposed to win the World Cup, people started getting more and more interested in, 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 in the country itself, in the culture. And that's because they would see players that don't look, you know, they have like 22 players that don't look alike. And then the players, uh, because they're second generation, more like 90 percent of them were born in Europe. Uh, there's a very close proximity and, and relationship between Europe and 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 Morocco, uh, just because it's very close to it. It's uh, it's 10 miles away from Spain, so um, there is there is a big like melting pot right there. And then you know like Fox would start asking questions like, why do they have players who speak German, and why do they have players who speak Spanish and English? And so a lot of people I think discovered <laughs> discovered that Morocco is not in the Middle East; it's in North Africa. Uh, again, it's 10 miles away from Spain. Like when growing up, I used to spend most of my summers in Spain and I, I had the chance. So I, I was a pretty good tennis player. That's how I ended up in, in the U S I got recruited to play tennis for Drexel. So when I was younger, I would travel a lot, uh, you know, with the Moroccan national team all over the world. And, you know, it was almost my job to basically explain to people that Morocco is not in the Middle East. Yes, it's 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 an Arab speaking country, but it's in Africa. Uh, it's also an Am- Amazigh uh, slash Berber country, like the first the original people of Morocco before the Arabs uh, went and, 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 and conquered uh, Morocco. They're Amazigh, they're Berbers, they're basically blonde, blue eyed. So, you know, it, it was it was a chance to, to, to teach people about the culture, but also like almost like an intro, like it was an introspection kind of job where I always wondered why I was interested in other cultures. And that's why I ended up like, you know, dating girls from all over the world, getting married to a girl from the deep south in the U.S. Um, At least you figured out where the best women were. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Very nice. Well, you know what? Regardless of what kind of country it is, Mm -hmm. one thing we know for sure is Morocco went farther than any of the other ones in this World Cup. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, man. So I'm pleased that you were able to describe to those guys exactly, well, what gives you credibility, you know, street cred, global cred, if you will, not just the street, right? In terms of the discussion at hand today, you've been to a whole lot of different countries, you know, like you just alluded to, you were a tennis guy, so you're an Mm -hmm. athlete, probably pretty attractive to those women elsewhere. So with that in mind, go ahead and tell us a little bit about your travels, Waleed, and then start talking to us about women all over the world in your own words. Let's have it. 
Yes. So uh, again, like I was, I was very lucky that you know my my dad pushed me to play uh, tennis when I was six years old, and you know he was, I you know, he was very serious about me, you know, becoming pretty good at it, and I I, really, I very much enjoyed it. So when I was about you know starting when I was 10, 11 years old, my dad, I, you know, my I'm lucky that I was from a privileged kind of you know uh, environment, so like my dad would send me uh, to all these tennis camps uh, all over Europe. So the first one that I went to was in France. The second one, the summer after that, was in Portugal and Spain. Um, and then I started traveling with the Moroccan national team under 14, under 16, under 18. Uh, to represent Morocco, mainly in Africa. So like we would go to South Africa, Tunisia, south of the border, Egypt, uh, but also, you know, in the rest of the world. Like I I traveled to Singapore, uh, I traveled to uh, Japan, um, you know, places like the Turkey. And the more I traveled, the more I thought, you know, I, I just, I, again, like I was so fascinated by different cultures. And because... You know, when you're traveling as an athlete, uh, basically the men are your competition. So you don't make too many friends with the men, you know, because you may be playing them the next day. Uh, however, you know, because of these tournaments, you know, they had the men's side and then the women's side. We f- I found myself and, you know, my, my even with my other friends, we would find uh, ourselves like, you know, talking to girls from different countries and then having little flings for the summer with those girls. Uh, so, you know, I... From day one, like I, you know, I started dating like uh, during these tournaments, during these tennis camps, dating, you know, South African girls or, you know, Spanish girls, French girls. Um, and the fact that I started speaking Eng- like English was the was the, the, the main language there, you know, for, for you to communicate. And, you know, I, I learned English when I was about nine, 10 years old. And, you know, that made, uh, you know, there was no language barrier and you could you could focus on, you know, learning more about those people. And I think that the more I dated or met girls from different countries, um, I would try and, you know, stay in touch with them. But then when it was, when I was 18 years old, I had to make a huge decisions, right? So Morocco is a French speaking country. Um, and I went to French schools and 98% of my, um, high school friends, uh, my best friends, they all went to, to school in, in France. Um, and I had never been to the U.S. So, you know, when, when I was in, in my last year of high school, some of the coaches for, for uh, American universities started reaching out because they could see my ranking in, in, in Africa. And they started uh, wanting to recruit me, basically. But I had never been to the U.S. For me, it was just like this place that's so far away. Yes, I had traveled to a lot of places. Uh, but still, for me, like the U.S. was, was far and and there was, you know, you're 17, 18 years old. Like my only image of the U.S. was uh, American Pie. You know, like this. It, you, you go, <laughs> you go to, to the U.S. and it's so much fun. Whereas the French system is completely different. Like the French education system is completely different. Uh, there is no American Pie. Like it's all about studying and it's all about, um, you know, learning everything by heart. It's not about the human experience. It's more about learning and learning and learning. Um, so I decided to, to come to the U S that summer after my, uh, my high school graduation, just to see what it looked like. And I went to Miami, I went to Philadelphia, I went to New York and I was like, I'm definitely going here. <laughs> um, and I chose a school that, uh, I chose a school that, uh, that had a, a, a big international like, community. Uh, but for some reason I kept getting attracted. Maybe it was the, the whole American pie, uh, effect, you know, like I, I almost like fantasized about American girls and blonde American girls and me too. And I, <laughs> I've been here and my I, whole life. <laughs> and I found myself dating, you know, girls from the Northeast, girl from that, from this and from that. But my first like relationship, like the first girl that I fell for, I was maybe 20, 21, um, having the time of my life in university, playing tennis. Uh, and she was from like Bumble F, uh, Virginia. Um, and I realized, you know, like we may be from, and she had never been obvious. Like she thought she, she was like, she couldn't believe that Morocco was in Africa. She was like, why aren't you black? And I'm like, you know, because, <laughs> because I'm not black. I'm, you know. Uh, but she she ne- didn't know anything about Morocco. I, I had I didn't know anything about the South. Uh, we used to play schools in the South, but it was just like we would play and come back, right? Like I, I never 
you know, like the image that I have of the South is like they're racist and this, this and that, because that's, you know, that's, that's, that's all I knew. That's, you know, the, the, the civil, the civil war and stuff like that. But we ended up hitting it off and like, you know, dating for the next seven years. Um, and I realized that, you know, we may be different from like completely different places, but sometimes, like, as long as you have the same values, like people in the South are known for being hospitable and, you know, they, they, food is huge in the South, just like in Morocco, like we're hospitable, food is huge, <laughs> it's warmer, the weather is warmer. Um, I realized that, you know, and then when she came to Morocco, she, re- she loved it, you know, she fell in love with it. She almost felt like at home. And when I went to visit uh, her home, it, I felt like I was at home. So, you know, I, I think if if I had a lesson, if I had a lesson to tell people when at that time, if people asked me and they would be like, oh, should I date this girl? But she's from a different country and this, this and that. Um, that should be the last thing on your on your checklist. I know at, at the end of the day, I think we can connect at, at different levels um, than where we are from or what your background is or what your you know, political affiliation is. Um, so, you know, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, man, go ahead and give me a random stream of consciousness about the types of things that have struck you over the years as you've gotten to know women in various countries and seen what they're like relative to women in other countries. What are the similarities? What are the differences? What are the countries where you think the women are particularly excellent? (laughs) You know, riff away, man. Yeah, so at at the end, and and I'll speak from my experience, right, and somebody from a different place, from a different background, we're we're the product of nature and nurture, right? Like nurture is uh, where we grow up and how we grow up, uh, but nature is just, are just things that we're born with, genetically, like we're some kind of people. So from my experience, uh, you know, I tried dating, for example, like I know that Eastern European girls are are pretty popular here in the U.S. Like I I was never able to... just put a period on the end of pretty sorry you could just put a period on the end of the word pretty, pretty there. there you go yeah. <laughs> and so from my experience i was never like and i'm you know i may have dated like you know four five six eastern european girls i was never able to connect with them whether whether when i was younger you know on those tennis camps or when i was older um i just you know from from a cultural standpoint i feel like that nature part we're just Sometimes when you're too different uh, culturally, I think it makes it a lot harder, especially when the relationship becomes more serious, right? And we'll talk about my marriage and stuff like that later. But as far as, um, you know, Eastern European girls, just because they're a lot, I wouldn't say colder, but they're very like factual, like, you know, instead of like the, the, the culture that I'm from where it's more Mediterranean, like you're more hot blooded, you're more emotional, you, you go more with your heart, uh, rather, rather than, than your brain when it comes to relationships. So I was never able to, to connect with Eastern European girls, for example. However, um, Southern, um, South American girls or girls from the South in the U.S., like, you know, they're more hot blooded. They're more, when it comes to relationships, they go more with the heart than with the brain and the facts. So, you know, um, I feel like I knew very early on uh, that um, I did not want to marry like a Moroccan girl. This, if, Even though my parents wanted me to marry a Moroccan girl because it's less language barrier. And, you know, it's, it's a lot easier culturally and you don't need to make too many adjustments. But I always knew that I wanted to marry somebody who's going to keep me, who's different, right? Like. Different, but same, if that makes any sense. So different as far as me wanting to learn about her culture. So, for example, my ex-wife is from the South. And you ask me, uh, I, I currently have in my living room a, a Christmas tree, right? Because uh, it's something that I that I picked up by marrying a girl from the U.S. Because Christmas was huge for her. And it's something that I enjoyed. Whereas if I had married a Moroccan girl, I would, ne- you know, Christmas is just Christmas. Like, you know. Um, I, I feel like you can enrich yourself by meeting different people. And from a relationship standpoint, I, I honestly think so a lot of people, when the relationship becomes a little bit, you know, it gets, sometimes it can get a little bit old, right? Like you can get in, into your routine, you're doing your thing, your wife or your uh, girlfriend is doing her thing. But if you're different enough that you're always making an effort to adapt to her culture, to her needs, 
uh, I think it can keep it spicy, right? Like it, it can keep that relationship spicy. You're learning more and more and growing as, as a couple. So that's one aspect. If I had to do it all over again, I am currently divorced. And that's why the, the show, my show is called American Divorce Stories. Uh, however, if I had to do it all over again, I would do it the same exact way. I would marry a girl that, uh, that's different than me but that where we can connect at some levels, right? Like we, for my ex-wife, we connected at the family level, like family was big for her, from, uh, family was big for me. Respect for the eldest is, is something very important. Like she had a huge respect for for her um, eldest. I have, you know, a huge respect for, for, for my eldest. And I sh- actually it was one of the things that all of the media during the World Cup, were highlighting about Morocco. So the Moroccan players, whenever the game is over, they would go and bring their moms into the field and party and like dance with them and 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 kiss them and just show their respect to them. And and in the World Cup, you know, like people were like, "What are they like? This is so different yet so cool." So you know, we did connect at those levels. Um, and if I had to do it all over again, I would do it the same exact way. Well, you know, uh, you just threw a lot of high-quality candy at that parade, my good friend. (laughs) Where do I even start? Uh, You know, I find it very heartwarming, actually. It brought a smile to my face Mm. to listen to you talk about finding someone who shares your values but is culturally challenging or unique Mm. or intriguing to you so that you can – introduce each other to your respective Mm -hmm. realities, even though you think alike, you believe in many ways alike. And I think that is just fantastic. Mm -hmm. I also have to stop and camp on the thought for a little bit about Eastern European women versus South American women, Mm -hmm. because I think that's exactly why these guys are showing up to this particular show. (laughs) Oh, man. Guys think they want an Eastern European woman because they're sexy and they're flat out, straight up gorgeous. Mm. But you know what? Did you ever hit the nail on the head when you started talking about that Eastern European Russian sensibility, whereas they're really cold, Mm. blunt, and matter of fact, Mm. right? Mm. Oh, my goodness. That is so true. And an interesting thing about people who immigrate to the West, Mm. I call it the West, as opposed to that being the East. Uh, and hit countries like the United States and Canada, the men have a very difficult time socializing because people see that blunt, just brutally honest, mm. and you called it cold, which mm. I think is also accurate, sensibility and just think it's mean and kind of represents the face of that Russian bear, that enemy that we've always dreaded. Mm-hmm. Whereas with the women, plenty of guys are clouded by beauty vision. They're sweet, they're friendly, they smile, they're very feminine. You know, they'll make you a sandwich and not complain. You know, that kind of woman. Yeah. Um, very flirty, right? Mm-hmm. Sex is kind of out there in that culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's not until they get into the relationship with a woman that they start feeling like, man, she's kind of really cold and sort of brutal under there. How do I deal with this? I mean, can I peacefully coexist with that? And guys just don't see that coming, but it's very, very real. Uh, anybody who's seen the TV show Shameless uh, probably got a good laugh. Oh, my God. When the Russian girls start taking <laughs> over love that. the alibi, yeah, 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 you know, because, yeah. boy, that was so true to life. That's mm-hmm. exactly – it was a caricature, but that's mm-hmm. exactly how that personality type and that cultural mindset trends is what you see mm-hmm. on that show. Like, why would you want to do that? That just means you're stupid. <laughs> you know, they'll say that out yeah, loud. And I, and I think a test, like, and the, the, you know, when I was 18, obviously, like I would, you know, like the Eastern European girls are huge in tennis, obviously. So like yes, a lot of, sure. a lot of, a lot of the, the girls were from Eastern Europe. And, but the older you get, you're like, okay, like if you, for me, the test is if somebody locks me uh, in the same room with, this girl for five days, right? Like, and we can have as much sex as we want and we can, you know, (laughs) for five days, is it going to be fun? And most of the time, if you you know, it's going to be no, right? Like, because first of all, like I can't have sex for five days straight. You can only go so many rounds, Bubba. Exactly. (laughs) And you just, you know, at at some point you want to talk about something else or like you want to connect, you want to feel like you're sometimes without even talking, like, you know, feeling like you're connected to that person. And it never happened to me with, with Eastern European girls. Uh, does that mean that they don't have people that they're, that they're going to be 
super connected with. I'm not sure at which level because I'm not I'm not there. I, you know, I can't relate. Uh, you know, it just means that for me, it, you know, it's something that, that did not work. And I, yes, I, we live in a world where sex is like, you know, I mean, it's thrown at you everywhere. Like I remember, you know, for me, like I used to, when I was 16, you know, in the nineties, like you had to go through hurdles to find porn. Now, like, you know, there is porn on it. Like I don't even ask for porn. And then I find it in front of me on Instagram. And I'm like, is this even legal? Like she's naked. Like, why is she on Instagram naked? Why are you being naked? Why are you being why, so like stupid? why? Like, Go back like inside. Why? Put some clothes. <laughs> like, like why? Now you're acting like your Russian girlfriend. <laughs> so you know, I, you know, for different people have different uh, criteria, but sometimes you know, you know, you may want to take a step back and, and just wonder if that criteria and it may be good for for a weekend, right? Like, but for a longer relationship, you know, it may or may not work. On that note of stepping back, let's talk about those Latina women. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they are not cold and icy. They are hot and they are passionate. Mm-hmm. And once again, they are gorgeous. Oh, they're exactly. so hot. I remember I grew up in Baltimore. Mm-hmm. You and I have the uh, shared distinction of having gone to college in Philadelphia, which mm-hmm. we'll talk about. But when I moved to Yuma, Arizona in 1992, I had really never encountered Latinas before. Mm. And now all of a sudden I'm immersed in that world. Mm. And I fell in love with those women immediately. I was like, oh, man, what have we been missing? (laughs) And that's before they started cooking for me. (laughs) (laughs) But you don't upset them. I mean, their emotions are going to be just one level short of getting plates thrown at you like in The Godfather if you get them crossways. But boy, (laughs) are they hot. Oh, God, they're so sexy. I'm... I'm married to a half Latina, of course, right now. And I think that's just about right. You know, she's half Southern and half Latina. Mm. I think I hit the jackpot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. What would you have to say about the nature of femininity as a female trait, as kind of the set of traits, if you will, that describe femaleness and how they're the same or different all over the world? Talk to me about femininity internationally. So I'll talk about it in, in, in today's like context and, and environments. Um, I I do think, you know, that. It's not it's, a trick question, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not uh, trying to trick. It sounds like it. <laughs> well, let me, well, you know what? Let me go ahead and spill my own beans here. I, I was <laughs> interested to see what your first hand take would be, but I have found it fascinating. Mm. The dance of masculine feminine attraction, mm-hmm. the nature of masculinity and femininity mm-hmm. seems to be an international language. Everywhere you go, women are feminine. They're about comfort and joy and fun and play. Mm-hmm. And really, that's not under fire anywhere in the world. Now, it gets a little bit more complicated when you talk about masculinity, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's not as politically correct anymore. There are governments who'd like to take over the role of being head of household and having the power over the family unit. Uh, But men being providers, protectors, presiding over their realities and providing leadership and safety to uh, a home environment Mm -hmm. so that femininity and their family can thrive – I think that's universal too, even if guys have become a little confused and reticent to exercise. Yeah. So Scott, I'm I'm gonna completely challenge you on that, right? So Go ahead. So I I, I live and I I wouldn't again I wouldn't have it any other way. So I live in New York, right? Um, Sure. and my ex wife and my daughter who's four years old, uh they live in Miami, so I have to go see her every couple of weeks. So um, and then I'm going home to Morocco on Thursday, spending three weeks there. So I'm always like, you know, in this, and I feel like each, every single place that I'm going to talk to you about now has a completely different, yes, on paper, the definition is the same. The man, yes, he's the man and the woman is supposed to be there, whatever. Okay. However, I do think that, um, the dynamics are completely different, right? So now in 2022 and in the U S like, I feel like, you know, because men have been, you know, leading this world for centuries, right? And we're in a horrible place as as a human beings. I think it's, you know, the, the women in the West are basically like, we're sick and tired of this shit where we need to take over. But they're, uh, 
but because it's coming from like a place of almost anger, right? Like it came from Weinstein raping women and it came from, um, you know, all these people doing horrible things. And let's not forget. When you say it, what are you talking about? Let's not forget that women in this country like did not only started um, voting like half half a human being ago, right? Like they're they you know for for centuries and centuries they basically had to step back and let men lead and do whatever they need to do. And I don't think the result is amazing. Now I'm gonna compare it to the other one, right? Like I'm gonna compare it to I just brought it up earlier, and and you can go and Google it and see. Um, the dynamic of the World Cup with the, the Moroccan uh, Moroccan team, you know, they're they're full of superstars, and at the end of the game, they go to their moms. And people from the West, they're like, did they grow up like without fathers? Is it like you know, a lot of people, like a lot of black people, for example, here because of the war on drugs, they grew up without fathers, right? Like, and they're like, no, 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 absolutely not. Like, you know, they have fathers and they have mothers. However, in our culture, like you respect women more. And if you go to Morocco, you may think that, you know, the men are the one who are controlling the society. But for centuries, the men have not been controlling society. It's the woman who controls the family. She's like the she's the, the, the nucleus of the family, right? Like Hold on a second. Mm. Let's not conflate personal power, familial influence. And the ability to be strong, gritty, and intelligent mm-hmm. with masculine, feminine. Yeah. Because what I'm talking about is the nature of women providing in the sense of joy, comfort, and stability in mm-hmm. the household. Mm-hmm. And of course, women are smart enough, capable enough, gritty enough to be mm-hmm. captains of industry and to lead. I mean, mm-hmm. these guys know that my daughter is thriving as a badass in a sport that's dominated by boys. Which is? It doesn't make her, oh yeah, which is BMX racing. Oh, wow. She's a champion. There you go. Okay. And she's gritty and she's tough and she falls and scrapes her knee and gets up and says, I'm all right. But she's still wearing pink and purple and mm-hmm. giggles a lot and likes to make everybody around her feel better. Yeah. What I'm talking about is that which sexually attracts man to woman. I see. So a matriarchal society in terms yeah. of a woman being the one who runs the household, mm. my response to that is... Typically, and we've had guys on this show talk about this, several, mm-hmm. when the women have something nailed, when they're in charge of it, mm-hmm. men go on to something else. Mm-hmm. You know, if women are going to the PTA meetings, women have all the laundry handled, women are balancing the checkbook, doing the taxes, yeah. men will go for something else. Yeah. So in the context of masculinity and femininity, mm-hmm. what I've noticed is women still love to wear pretty colors and dance and smile. And in that case, I completely agree with you. I completely, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. But I think it's important that we differentiate the cultural trappings of mm. that with any kind of power dynamic or mm. what's going on with men behaving badly, which, of course, they have. Of course, Do yeah. I think it's a little bit overblown? Uh, well, sure, mm. because I think men have also brought a lot of wonderful things to the world. Yeah. And my stock challenged any woman who thinks every man is a horrible person is the next time you need to call the police and or call the fire department because there's a crisis afoot. Mm-hmm. Why don't you call one of your girlfriends instead mm-hmm. and handle it mm-hmm. yourselves? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there is definitely an element of masculinity and femininity mm-hmm. having purpose and balancing each other out from a practical perspective. And I don't actually think that's gone by the wayside as much as is advertised, because even in homosexual relationships, someone usually plays the masculine and the mm-hmm. feminine role, yeah. respectively. But I do absolutely champion the idea of women having equal rights, being able to vote, making equal money for doing the same job. But at this point also, I am also championing the rights of a dad to decide he does not want to be a father if a woman can decide sure. she doesn't want to be a mother. And I think that's mm-hmm. some, you know, those are some gray areas where I think society still gets crosswise. But I'll tell you, of the 110 countries I've been to, I have photographic evidence, mm-hmm. you know, and social evidence, anecdotally, of course. Mm-hmm. You know, I have I can bring back anecdotal evidence from everywhere I've been that women are women and men For at sure. least try to be men. I think in developing countries, it's less clouded by politics and by media driven perceptions yeah. that men need to step aside and let someone else, uh, you know, have personal power. Mm-hmm. But, you know, in Cambodia, you see the women dance and they're still beautiful For and sure. feminine. 
and ethereal and angelic mm-hmm. and bringing joy and fun and play to the world. And exactly. certainly in, in Mexico and Central America, Eastern Europe, and, and even here in the United States, you know, when women are left to their own devices, that's really what they want to do is they want to bring joy, fun, and play. Completely agree. Yeah, yeah. And that's what makes us attracted to them sexually. Meanwhile, a guy who tries to be effeminate, who defers to a woman, who says, oh, this situation, very dangerous, you go first. Even the strongest, smartest, grittiest woman is going to find him repulsive. For sure. For sure. All these guys who go to feminist rallies dressed in pink pussy hats going, you know, the future is female. Those guys think they're giving women what they want from them. And all those guys are going hungry sexually. Again, I, you know, yeah. I think when we start doing that, we start deviating from the, 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 the nature part of us. Like for, for, yes. for centuries, for centuries, we've been that way. We were created that way. And it would take like an insanely amount of effort, like, you know, to, to, to change that dynamic, right? So I was you watching, can't. I was They're watching, trying. yeah, you I was can't. watching 60 Minutes Australia, uh, a couple of days ago. And they, sometimes they go to the, these very far, uh, far away places and they went to Swaziland, which is like a very small country in, 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 uh, in the, in the south of Africa. Um, and they still have a king, right? And they're not very developed. Uh, and they went and talked to the king and the king has like 12 or 13 wives and he does not, he seems like the nicest human being ever. And then they were like, why do you need 12 wives? And he was like, so like, that's how, that's how for centuries and centuries, the king he had 12 wives. And you know, that's, uh, um, he was like, I don't even know. That's how we are. And he was like, can you go and ask the people? And the people were like, out of respect, out of this, out of that, we, you know, we like, we have no problem with the king having 12 wives. And, uh, you know, he, they spoke to his wives. They seemed super happy. It's just that, you know, I feel like we're, that's how, that's like the, the women were supposed to be the softest side, like the softer side. We need like, you know, we need a combination of soft and, and, you know, less soft. And I think men were created to do that and women were created to do that, to, to be, you know, softer, like you say, than, and having that feminine side. But I completely agree with you, you know, uh, all over the world, that's how the dynamic is. And I think when we start, uh, when we start trying to change that dynamic is when we start deviating from who we are. And that's when we start having problems. And that's when we start having, you know, this, these, um, these power struggles that don't make any sense. It's like, we, you know, we can be equal as far as rights, but we can be different as, as, a, as human beings. Yeah, that's why I kind of jumped in there because I sensed you were taking this from a social perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm talking about a primal perspective. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And interestingly enough, as much pressure as there is on heterosexual relationship and, you know, by proxy, the birth rate, they're just fighting a tsunami. I mean, sex yeah. is the greatest power in the universe in terms of being unstoppable. I mean, you could argue love and that's kind of pretty and nice, but boy, human beings are going to keep screwing and making mm-hmm. babies, whether yeah. anybody else likes it or not. Fantastic conversation. I'm going to go ahead and punctuate this by saying my assumption is American women are still your favorite. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. You know, what's funny. I love American women. I love women from all over the world. You talked about having women from different cultures, mm. different accents. I always have the deepest, most intelligent conversations with women who share my first language mm. as much as I love the accents yeah. from some of these sexy women elsewhere. Yeah. Maybe it's just a personal quirk. I think we're, we're very much on the same page. Yes, because you, you know, you're, you know, you can, I mean, when there is a, a, a language barrier, at, you know, believe me, like 50% of the interaction like goes away because, you know, it's not natural. Um, so yeah, like if I, you know, I think one of the main reasons I can, I was able to relate to all these American girls is because, you know, I, I had good Eng- like English was never like a problem. Um, yes. When I do speak again, like when, if we want to go back, go back to Eastern European women who were not born here and who have only been here for like a year or two, there is that language barrier. And, you know, I don't think you want that when it comes to interaction between men and women. I'll tell you what makes me ill is when I know I just have this gut feeling that guys are getting a woman from Colombia or from, say, uh, Ukraine, especially mm. right now, mm. specifically because they're no good with women and that's their best shot at it. And one of the reasons they've never had any success with women is because they want to control women and put them under their thumb and be abusive. 
And once they bring a woman here, they're just going to absolutely control her because of the language barrier. That's such a good point. That's such a good point. And, uh, you know, like for to those men, all I want to say in a very humble way, work on yourself first and then go look for a partner. Because when you find that partner, when you had work, when you had already done the work on yourself, I think it's going to make it so much more magical. And, you know, I think you're, you're basically taking a step back to take two steps forward instead of taking one step back before taking 20 steps backward if if, if that's your uh, outlook on life. And those guys don't even know what they're missing out on. The yeah. veil just hasn't been lifted for them. So yeah, I agree. With and that's you. why podcasts like your, like your podcast, you know, they, you know, I honestly think that, you know, for the past couple of few years, I think, you know, just like these health, self-help podcasts, like made me a better person. Um, and you can, it's not, it's not 1920 anymore where like you didn't have any resources to improve yourself. You know, if you have problems with women, just listen to these podcasts, like, you know, try to understand the dynamics from people that have gone through it, uh, instead of experiencing it yourself and making all the mistakes yourself. There are people who can help you with their own experience. And I think that's what your podcast does. And, you know, think twice before, (laughs) before getting into a relationship, just because the, the woman is, is, is hot. Yeah, there's a lot more to it than that. Find a hot woman who treats you right as well and then mm-hmm. treat her right. Be happy yeah. together. Excellent. Exactly. Well, Roger, all of that, Mike. <laughs> <Good tuners, laughs> Another fun one. Another man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, his name is Valid El Jabari, and he's in New York City right now, originally from Morocco. And guys, you should drop everything and go listen to American Divorce Stories, hosted by the very same Valid El Jabari. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, he delves into people's backstories a lot more than I do and uh, makes it for a completely different kind of show than what you're used to here and a whole lot of fun. Waleed, man, thanks for dropping by. This thanks, is a great God, discussion. I knew it was going to be fun. It, it was It was even more fun than I expected. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm. And guys, if you have not visited mountaintoppodcast.com lately, we're into a brand new year. It is 2023. It is time indeed for you to be the best man you possibly can be. You can even surprise yourself by being even better than you ever expected you could be. That can only lead to getting better women in your life and more of them if you so choose. That's what our masterclass for men was on this past month, and it was wildly popular. Great success. You can check out all the master classes and more when you go to mountaintoppodcast.com. Also, click the red button at the top of the page to get on my calendar and talk to me free for 25 minutes. Hey, the new year is here. The new you is just around the corner. And let's get a new girlfriend in your life to go along with all of that. The first 25 minutes is on the house. We can talk about where you are right now, where you want to be. And I'll be exactly the same guy you expect me to be. I don't play a fictional character on this show, gentlemen. So go ahead and get on my calendar at mountaintoppodcast.com. While you're there, please check out Jocko Willink's company, Origin in Maine, the very best jeans and boots you can imagine. He's now got hunting gear to go along with the Brazilian jiu-jitsu gear. Man, he can outfit you for all sorts of manly stuff, as can keyport.com if you do not have one of keyport's everyday carry gadgets in your life yet this is not your father's swiss army knife go check out keyport.com my son my daughter my wife and i all have keyports we all carry them around oh man every single day when i'm without my keyport i invariably need it and i'm sorry i don't have it they're really cool you can personalize them Check out Key Ports. Also check out Hero Soap so you can smell like a man. And if you have yet to take a shower with a member of the female persuasion using their bath gel, you are missing out on one of life's great pleasures. I've said that before. I will continue to shout that from the rooftops. Actually, I'll probably shout that from the shower, but, you know, too much information. Use the coupon code MOUNTAIN10 when you partake of any of the goodies from Origin from Hero Soap or Keyport and tell them I sent you. It's all there for you and more at mountaintoppodcast.com. And until I talk to you again real soon, this is Scott McKay from X and Y Communications in San Antonio, Texas. Be good out there. The Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com 
for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for the Mountaintop Podcast.